All right, sweet. Uh, so we're on week two. Um, like I said before, this is going to be really focused on CAD and uh, really just the features um, of Inventor that you can make use of. So uh, just a brief overview. We've got work planes. Um, uh, several of the features, features can be a keyword here. It's not just a, um, a facet of the software, but the feature is any kind of three dimensional um, aspect of a part, um, whether it be loft sweeps, shells, um, or holes, and the rest we'll get to in detail. Uh, so, good CAD is kind of like good coding, where there's not really one right answer, but you can definitely look at something and say that's good CAD. Um, those features are responsiveness, right? If I have just at a very basic level, a metal sheet. Um, if the metal sheet part breaks down, changing the width or length of it, it's not really good CAD. Um, designs change all the time, and you got to be ready for that. Simple. Uh, if I get down into your part and I see it's made up of 30 sketches, and once again, it's just a rectangular prism, there's something going on here, and a team member is going to have a really hard time figuring out that part um, to contribute to it or to use it elsewhere. Uh, and then robust. I mean, this goes hand in hand with responsive. Um, just it shouldn't break when you make simple changes to it. Um, part of getting those three uh, aspects down, um, you use work planes to do that. Work planes bring you a step above the simple like X, Y, Y, Z planes, you know. Um, you can start off your part on those very fundamental planes, but work planes let you um, take a look at your existing geometry and really expand on it rather than creating all these individual parts based on the fundamental planes um, and then tacking them together. You can kind of build off of what you already have. They're effectively the, the 2D equivalent to a construction line. Um, where ideally you shouldn't see the work plane in the finished product, but it's very fundamental to creating it. Um, some examples, you can use surfaces to mirror the part, right? So maybe you have some complex geometry on one side and it's identical on the other side. You really only have to CAD one side and then create a work plane that logically divides wherever the symmetry is in the mirror of that, um, really just making your work a lot easier. And uh, we got a little oh, videos after this slide. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on all these different work plans um, because honestly, the best way to learn them is to use them. Um, just recognize that all of these exist. Um, you can see them in the plane drop down. Um, and a lot of the groundwork has already been done to, done for you by inventor. Um, so really, just about any situation when you're like, oh, I kind of I wish I had a plane, a logical plane to base my work off of. They have some form of the tool for you already. A really nifty one is that tangent to surface uh, through edge one towards the bottom there. Um, basically, if you just have like a rod of some kind, you can create a work plane that's just snug up against the side of that cylinder. Um, and now you can start catting based off of that work plane um, in a way that's kind of hard to do without work plane if you try to create a separate CAD and attach it in some way. Um, but yeah, just be aware that these exist. And if you're ever thinking, oh, I need a work plane for some task, take a look at these. The names are really helpful in what they actually do. We're going to watch a quick video here. Um, this is going to show the offset. I don't know how well this is going to transfer in a stream. Uh, but basically walking through it, uh, they have, they're about to select one of the fundamental planes. I believe in this case it's the XZ. Yep. Um, so that is your reference geometry for the plane tool. Um, all the different plane tools, they have specific reference geometries. So this one, the offset plane tool, uh, that takes a existing plane as an input the uh, tangent to curve that takes some curve um, geometry, right? 
whether it's an existing revolve or some something like that as an input. Um, I believe most of those plain tools will tell you in their description what they want. Um, if not, the documentation is very extensive. Lofting. Now this one is uh, it's an interesting feature, um, but when you use it, it can make some pretty cool shapes. Basically, you're going to take some starting cross section geometry of your 3D shape, whether it be like a circle, a rectangle, or whatever you want. You're going to take that starting cross section and then choose an ending cross section, not necessarily the same shape. It could be the same shape but smaller. Uh, it could be a, uh, a brand new shape. And Loft will connect those two cross sections in such a way that it now has a 3D um, geometry in between them which an abstract it kind of doesn't make sense um, but this video on the next slide is going to make it make a lot of sense um, just think of like a cone with the top chopped off which you're about to see here right so the first reference geometry is a circle cross section uh, he's going to make a second circle cross section that is smaller than the larger one. Then using the loft feature, uh, he's going to select both, uh, um, both geometries as input. And there, it will connect those two geometries uh, in a continuous way between them. And you can use this with whatever, not even circles, but rectangles or squares. Um, really, it's just bounded by what you can create in those two sketches. Oh, yeah, so he's going to go on to do it with rectangles as well. Um, but the idea is the same. This, however, is pretty interesting because we'll see a, a reference geometry on the bottom is a circle, whereas the top is, uh, I believe that's just a rectangle. Um, and yeah, you can get these interesting shapes very easily with that tool. Something to keep in mind, though, is specifically that part. Um, those are really hard to machine just in general. Um, I'm not sure if the Haas and the OCC can do it, um, but a lot of times lofted parts, um, we can't really machine those. So just be aware of that limitation. Sweeps. Um, best way to learn sweeps is by example, right? So if I have some um, cross section, but instead of changing the cross section as I go through the part, um, I'd like to change the path that it follows. Um, you can actually see here at the pipe, um, we have the starting cross section of a circle, um, and then just the, the straight line path that takes, I believe, three turns along its route, um, and it just follows along with it. I believe uh, even the corners are rounded off, so you get like an, a, a real life pipe. Um, you could do these with extrudes. Um, like anything in CAD, you can do it in infinite many ways. Um, there are just some ways that are a lot easier to deal with, a lot quicker to get to. Uh, and then when someone looks at your CAD, they don't think, oh God, what is this? Um, and here's another demo for the sweep tool. Yeah, a lot of time these uh, these tools, you really learn them well by just like playing around with them. But yeah, you can see here that first sketch is going to be the path that it takes, and then creating a second sketch, you create your cross your cross section geometry, and then when you choose the sweep tool. It's going to ask for two input geometries. Make sure that first one is what your cross section is. It's a, a profile. And the, sex, sex, uh, the second one uh, is labeled path as it should be. And that's, it's kind of easy if, you, if you're looking just for tags instead of just memorizing a process of clicking certain things. So if you use a new tool that says, oh, I want a path, you know, OK, it's kind of like the sweep path. Shells, these are a little weird, um, but they are very useful three, for 3D printing. Um, basically, you're going to take some three-dimensional uh, geometry, 
um, and hollow it out in some way, um, whether it's punching it out through one axis um, or through some other axis. Um, you can see on the slides some examples of where you would actually want to use them. Legos are a big one. If you can imagine the Lego started out as a rectangular prism uh, and then using the shell tool, they hollow it out while leaving a certain thickness on the outside. Very useful for 3D printing in the fact that you don't really want to print out all of the inside. Maybe you just want that outside geometry. And instead of manually punching out the inside with an extrude, shell does all the heavy lifting for you and leaves certain parameters like the thickness of the wall up to your discretion. And here's a quick demo of the shell. So yeah, you can see rectangular prism and they selected a certain um, two dimensional plane that they wanted to keep some thickness on. And then by going through with the process, you end up with your shell part. Very useful for 3D printing. And in fact, when you're choosing your thickness there, um, actually you can select a parameter instead of the number which makes this really good for parameterized CAD. So if I know, oh, this part, I want to make it maybe half an inch thick um, because it may need to like sustain some collision. And then you find out later on down the line, oh, actually this part probably should be a little thinner. It weighs too much and doesn't really need to be that strong. Um, if you parameterize the thickness, just changing that parameter will cascade through the shell and make it thinner. Whereas if you did it with an extrude, it's a little harder to parameterize a specific extrude um, to be offset just so from all the walls, uh, which makes this very powerful for that. Just another example of how there's multiple ways to do uh, the same feature, the same end result, um, but just some of them are quicker and uh, a lot more responsive. So today, or for this slide, We'll talk about fillets and chamfers. So just starting with your base geometry of a square, uh, a chamfer, you're going to just pretty much chop off a corner um, with just as um, with the same kind of like sharp edges as you started off with. Whereas a fillet is going to be a more smooth transition from edge to edge. And I know when I first learned about these, uh, I kept calling it fillet. Um, all throughout the first year and even a little bit of my second year, um, but I always got to remind myself it's a, it's a fillet. Um, but yeah, we use these a lot and you'll see some exam examples in the next slide. Um, fillets and chamfers change the, the geometry of a part, which um, it comes down to more material science principles that I'll be honest, I don't know the entirety of, um, but basically the less sharp edges you have in a part or an assembly, uh, the more shock resistant it is um, and the more it's going to stand up to whatever you throw at it, right? So airplanes, if you look at those windows, all the windows are filleted. Um, everything's got some gradual geometry to it, some curve. Um, nothing's really got sharp edges to it. And that's on purpose because now they're going to be more aerodynamic um, and more shock resistant. Um, the variable radius fillet. What's May up? I add something? Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, so the reason you want to avoid sharp edges is because that's where stress can get concentrated. There you go. That's the uh, that's the reasoning behind like my the the blind whatever I've been told and followed. <laughs> I just yeah. I, I remember my, my three pounds design review. Uh, our weapons had like just straight up corners on them, you know? Um, and we were told, oh yeah, th those corners are likely to, um, to either fracture, something's going to happen to them when you're whacking stuff with it. So just make sure to avoid sharp corners and whatnot. And I, I took the avoid sharp corners to heart and then the MSC stuff, I was like, okay, I'll, uh, 
try to remember that. But yeah, uh, chamfers and fillets, very useful and use those a lot in our CAD. Um, like you said, stress distribution, machining, this is a big one. So when you CAD parts, um, something you really got to keep in mind is machinability. Is the thing you're creating even physically possible, right? Uh, so if you put a pocket into a plate, right? So if I want to cut out a rectangular portion of the metal in the middle, um, it's really not that feasible to create sharp edges on those interiors because, I mean, you're going to cut it out with an end mill and the end mill is a circle. Uh, I don't really know how you're going to make a sharp corner out of a circle cutout. So as fillets and chamfers have benefits, but they're also realities we kind of have to deal with. Um, fillets, harder to manually machine because I don't know about you guys, but my arms and brain are not computerized, so I cannot perfectly move an end mill at a certain angle. Uh, and then, of course, 3D printing. Um, which I mean, everyone loves. Plus aesthetics, um, you don't want to get too caught up in making everything super functionally um, viable and then forget about how it looks. Uh, and so in the actual software, edge fillets, um, basically just select the tool, select the corner you want to round off, uh, and then it will let you input some, uh, some radius for the fillet. The radius, of course, can be parameterized as well. Um, and then the variable uh, sized fillet is, let's say, along the, the Z axis. If you're saying the Z axis from top to bottom of this part, um, what if my fillet shouldn't just be two from the bottom to the top? It should change going up. Um, you can get that with the variable fillet. Um, and actually, I'll go back a couple slides for a real life example. If you look at the plane from the uh, the wing up to the fuselage, that'll give that'll be a variable fillet. Um, yeah, sometimes these examples are really useful. Face fillets, these are a little nifty. Um, you can see how you go from the first part to the second part. Um, just how useful these can be. Um, it takes a lot of operations out of the equation and just simplifies it down to one. Uh, basically. As the uh, the red paint indicates, you just select the two faces you want to be joined, uh, and it will fill in the rest for you, making that a uh, smooth curve with whatever radius you give it. Full round fillet. Uh, this is um, just a fillet to electric boogaloo. So uh, you choose two faces, um, and it comes full circle with it. Um, really, just connecting those two. Chamfers. All right, so chamfers work much in the same way that fillets do, and right? that you select whatever corner you'd like to chop off or modify uh, and give it a radius, or in this case, a distance. And uh, it does all the work for you there. Um, you can also change the angle for the, fill or for the chamfer. Um, this is useful if um, maybe it's going to sit on some surface and you don't want the rest of the part to be up and down, but maybe canted to an angle. Um, those are all things that you can edit yourself, but 45 by 45 is the default. All right, now into the whole tool. So um, the common theme, you can do things multiple ways. There's a right way to do it, though. Uh, the whole tool should definitely be your go to um, for holes. Um, you can extrude a circular profile through a part um, and get quote unquote the same result. The whole tool gives you a lot of cool um, parameters you can edit though. It really makes it easy. So if we take a look at these screenshots, there's a lot going on, but it's actually super useful. Uh, so the, for the left one, that's a clearance hole. Uh, this is basically a hole that you're just going to drive a screw through, but you don't want the screw to actually um, interact with the walls too much. Uh, so it's going to be slightly bigger than whatever you're putting through it. By telling inventor that, that this is a clearance hole and then below telling it actually what kind of fastener is going to go through it, it does all the numbers for you. 
and chooses the correct radius. Uh, so you don't actually have to like pull out your handy dandy little chart of like, oh man, what's a 440 radius? Um, it does it all for you. Uh, same thing with the tap tool. It'll give you the correct radius slightly less than your fastener so that you can tap it and drive a, uh, a fastener through it. Um, it supports all sorts of different standards. Basically, if you're going to encounter it in the shop, Inventor's got the standard for it already preloaded. Um, the second row there, the seat, is also very useful. Uh, so a lot of times these fasteners, they have a, a head on them that you can drive whatever your screwdriver is into it. Uh, but you want that head to maybe sit below the surface um, of your part. So basically just um, you want it to sit flush, right? This will do that for you if you give it the, the head height. Um, actually, I don't. Yeah, so it's the, the whole tool is definitely the go to um, for whatever circular extrusions you want to do uh, that have fasteners involved. Uh, it's also just really convenient because, as the previous slide mentions, uh, it interfaces well with like point, um, point sketches, right? So if I make a sketch and add a bunch of points to it, uh, you can really quickly add holes on all of those points with the same radius as opposed to having to create like several different circle profiles. Yeah, here's a, uh, a demo for the whole tool. Really show what's going on. All right, so we're gonna take this rectangular block. We're gonna throw a couple holes on there. You guys know better to constrain them for your part, but this is just an example. Um, and then by selecting the hole tool, and then those points that you added earlier, actually it already fills them in. Um, you can create these through holes, either going all the way through the part uh, or ending at a certain depth. Uh, and then right there from the wizard, you can change the radius of these holes um, which is super powerful to do from one place. And there's no fasteners involved in this one, but you can see where you could input those parameters. All right, projecting geometry. This is probably going to be one of your most powerful tools using Inventor um, because it allows you to take existing geometry that you've done for some other feature, sketch, um, or existing part, and bring it out of that entity into this new sketch that you're doing. Um, basically, if I have an existing cylinder and I want to use the radius of that cylinder in a new circle, uh, I don't have to recreate that circle. I can just project it up into my new sketch and continue using it. And you'll see this more in the, uh, in the examples, but get used to this tool because uh, this is going to be super useful going forward. All right, so once again, starting with our, uh, our rectangular prism here, um, you can see there's already a rectangle that exists in this part but it's not in the sketch, right? Because you just started the sketch on the face, but it doesn't include anything that already exists. So throwing down a few shapes here, uh, making a cute little robot. <laughs> We're gonna see how these existing geometries in that, um, in that sketch can be used elsewhere. There we go. Uh, so using the plane from before, we're going to offset so that plane is parallel to the face of that rect rectangular prism, just further off of it in space. You can see the existing geometry below, and maybe you want to use it. There you go. So you're going to highlight those green with this tool, and now instead of having to recreate those uh, geometries, they are cast up into this new plane. Um, which is super powerful because now you just make, you just need to create it once uh, and now you can use it in several other sketches or other entities. Um, and when you change it in that first one, it propagates through the rest of them. That's the responsiveness we want in CAD. 
mirrors and patterns. This is going to save you a lot of time if you know how to use them correctly. Uh, mirror is just like the name implies. You can take existing geometry and mirror it over an existing axis or an existing plane. Uh, and patterns will let you create um, rotational patterns. So maybe you can imagine like um, like lug nuts on a car wheel, right? That's a rotate. That's a um, a circular pattern that you only really have to create one of those lug nut parts and then pattern it across that middle axle. And looking at an example here, starting with one of the fundamental planes, going to create some geometry. So in here you can see we're drawing um, effectively what is an existing axis, um, making that construction line. You can either do that or if you want to, opening up the origin folder, you can um, project the existing axis into the sketch and use that. Um, but either way works out that in fact that one may be a little easier to see. But yeah, so creating some geometry on one side of the axis. We highlight everything we want to copy. Uh, make sure you click everything you need. And in the mirror line, we choose what we just created at the start. And applying that, you can see it's ro or reflected across that axis. And yeah, that works for just about any geometry. The axis doesn't necessarily have, or the the mirror axis doesn't necessarily have to be one of the fundamental ones. It can be any arbitrary line that you select. A circular pattern, we'll see here in this example. Another good one in case you, uh, you don't feel like doing trig to calculate the actual X, Y coordinates of all your different holes, which I mean, who does? <laughs> you can uh, take an existing geometry, whether it's just that one hole you were talking about earlier, um, or it could be anything really, and rotate it around that center axis and create new copies of it. Um, so here we'll, we'll go ahead and create a point um, located to the left of the uh, center axis here. Um, and we want several of them around the axis. And so you can see now, uh, creating four of them, um, or any number of them, it'll evenly space it around the axis. And so instead of having to calculate those upper right and upper left ones, figuring out what the X, Y coordinates of them are, um, you just really quickly uh, place all these points. And save you a lot of time in the future. And that is it for this slide deck. Uh, we're gonna move on to Kahoot now. So if you guys could go ahead and pull up your devices and uh, fire up Kahoot, I'll go ahead and get it ready on my end as well. And we'll get into it. It's the time of reckoning. <laughs> it is be, the time of prepared. reckoning. Let's see if you guys remember everything we just learned. So am I still streaming? I think I was tethered to a standalone something. Here we go. All right, um, sharing the screen. Here we go. Yeah, I gotta say, when I first learned about that whole tool, um, it was like an eye opener. I've been like punching stuff out of circular streets up until then. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, I'll have to look up the four forty diameters anymore.
Okay. We're expecting seven. It is like a a lot unnerving, you know, like presenting, like having like a little like a little bit of feedback. Like they were the chance. Right. Now, now you have a respect for all your teachers who are trying to do it, right? <laughs> yeah, honestly, like, it was the same still, thing for me. I still felt a little bad for them, but like now I like actually know how it feels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Which is easier to make with mill? It sounds like your mic connection might be a little shoddy, Keaton. Like it's cutting in and out. Okay. I don't know if it's just like a plug or something, but maybe it's better now. Why is it? Yeah, this is a hard one. I'll be honest, when it first came out, I was like, oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, so an external chamfer, we're looking at um, like a rectangular piece that we're going to cut the corner off of, which if you just keep a, a steady angle from either right to top or top to, to side, um, you can do that at one stroke, whereas with an external fillet, um, doing that with a circular tool, you're going to need, you'll have to have some kind of computer guidance, you yeah. because you got to follow like an arc in the outside. Um, whereas like an internal fillet, you'll just get that naturally by the radius of your part or the radius of your tool. All right, which hole is wider? A clearance for or a I think your mic's doing that again. What's that? Yeah, your voice is choppy. Okay. Oh, I can try to fix that real quick, but all right, yep, clearance. Um, like the name implies, it needs to be large enough for a fastener to clear through it. One here. Which type of operation would you use to make this? So we're looking at the um, that top kind of dome shape there. That's probably not going to transition really easily. All right, full round fillet brings it all together from. Um, one or more faces. All right, what right, would be the movement? Movement? Sorry, I just meant the uh, <laughs> on the, oh, on on the, the chart. Words. I interrupted your question. I apologize. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> no. I mean, yeah, they can read. Uh, All right, so that lamp, uh, the base of it is a classic loft, right? A wider circle and a narrow circle. Uh, the sweep will let you take that, the, the neck of it through that complex path. And then that third loft will give you that like kind of tall cylinder, uh, like, I don't know, for the, the light casting. <laughs> Actually, I can see how the fourth answer would also be correct. You sweep the center first and then use loft. Of the two ends. Yeah, that that would yeah. really work. Which machine tool would you use to make an external fillet? Good. Have we gone over what these are yet? I'm not sure. 
Have we? I don't know if we've done shop tools yet. Yeah, we'll, we'll give you guys a pass on this one. Uh, water jet, I mean, you can make just about any geometry with. Um, well, I mean, I say that, but. Uh, and then a ball end mill, I believe that's the one that ends with a kind of like a dome shape. Um, which will give you awkward external fillets if you try to do that. What is the least important aspect to consider when creating features? Uh-oh. <laughs> How dare you guys. It needs to look good before it's functional. <laughs> the cat tool used to make this internal feature. To the uh, the inside of that Lego. There you go. Yeah, shell it out. Speed on that one. <laughs> Which shell option would you use to CAD these? Ooh, now this is a little specific for shell. I don't know. We would necessarily go over these. <laughs> it's just like questions in real classes. Sometimes you haven't gone over and you just sort of have to use context clues. <laughs> yep. All right. Face shell. Um, like I said before, with a lot of these tools to like to really get to know them, you got to just play around with them. Make some really cool shapes, maybe out some useful parts, uh, which of the following is not a necessary reason to use fillets. Looks pretty. So although that is useful, uh, not necessarily required unless you're trying to sell a product. <laughs> How many 2D sketches are required for a sweep? Two perpendicular uh, sketches. Now remember that's the one you have the one cross section and it follows a path. Uh, I guess if they were parallel that doesn't really make a lot of sense. But yeah, good job, guys. And we got Luke, eight out of 10, barely. That's just like milliseconds right there. There were a couple of uh, 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 questions that threw some curveballs, so I think uh, pretty yeah, good job, guys. Yeah, there's also that. <laughs> Yeah, that is it. Oh, we also have a survey I want to send out real quick. Um, basically, we're just looking for feedback. Kyle, do you, do you guys have the uh, link for that? Nope, but I can grab it. There we go. Uh, I, I wasn't like the last slide. All right, there we go. Yeah, so basically this, this link is a survey. Um, Looking for feedback on those cat guides and on materials. Um, basically, we're just we're always trying to improve. You know, if next year can be just even a little bit better than this year. Then it's a success. You know. <laughs> but okay. uh, yeah, if you guys. Okay, oh, yeah, good, John. Yeah. So, like, someone asked if we could do the cat guide for week two. Like, do you just want to quickly skim through it? We've got like 15 minutes. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, we can go through this. Um, let's pull up that slide deck real quick. All right. And I'm going to share my screen for this. Oh, let me present first. All right. So, the CAD Guide 2, uh, same name as the lecture features. I uh, just got a brief overview of what we went over in the lecture, basically those three key points. 
and we're going to ride into it. So this week we'll be making a V-belt. Um, this is stuff that you'll need for power transmission. Um, to get started with it, we're going to make the actual cross section for a sweep. Uh, to do that, we'll start off with this rectangle. The act dimensions are given. Um, but that's simple enough there. We're going to get a perpendicular sketch. Uh, now, so this first one is its own sketch. You'll have that open your feature tree by itself. Uh, you'll start a new one um, in a perpendicular plane. And then you'll want to give it a uh, like an oval type shape. And you'll see this. Yeah, so in this, we'll use the slot tool. Uh, and there's actually, it's the same drop down as the rectangle. So you'll need to change that to slot. Um, play, play around with those a little bit. There's two different slots. Um, I'm a fan of the center to center one just because it makes logical sense to me. Um, but yeah, so you'll you'll give it two centers, stretch that out, and this oval will be the path that your cross section takes to create your three dimensional part. Uh, and so you'll see this a little bit better. Uh, the dimensions are given as well for this. Um, I believe when you create the slot, it'll ask you for like the radius input, which is exactly what's given. And then you can just drag that out manually center to center, 20 inches. But yeah, uh, also uh, another good habit to get into is actually naming your sketches what they represent, as opposed to just having sketches one through 20 and you're kind of like rifling through them to figure out what you're looking for. So you can go ahead and name that slot path uh, and then name that rectangle we made earlier uh, base. And you can, as a side note, you can do this with features as well. Uh, parts, obviously, you're probably going to name on your own. Um, but yeah, naming features is really useful because when you need to go back and change your design, maybe after design review, and say, oh man, we don't want these like sharp um, extrusions on the part. Um, if you don't rename your features and it's a complicated part, you're going to be rifling through several different features trying to figure out which one it was that created that extrusion. So naming it just makes it um, a lot more sane. Uh, but yeah, here we go with the sweep. So selecting the sweep tool, and then you can either click on the sketch as it exists in that 3D render, or just click on it in the feature tree on the left. Um, but, but choosing the profile is that first one you made, and then the path as the slot, uh, you get this uh, nice looking uh, V belt. Uh, well, I mean, it will be, but a belt at least. Um, and that should all be one op operation. If you've if you've done those two sketches correctly, um, it'll give you this. I guess you can call it like a rubber band. Now we're uh, we're going to chamfer it to actually create that V effect. Um, so selecting the chamfer tool, you'll select. Um, one of the edges that you can see on the V belt, and that'll cut it down to create a more like acute angle. I believe there's a, a better picture. Yeah, so looking here, uh, you'll choose oh, this is after the chamfer, but yeah, you'll choose one of the edges to cut down uh, and then chamfer those off to make more realistic edges uh, than what your CAD probably represents at that point. Uh, the radius of this. Of course, it gives you 0.0625, uh, but play around with that a little bit. Uh, make it a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. Uh, there's a certain point where if you make the radius too big, uh, it starts getting ridiculous in like how it looks. Um, but playing around with those dimensions is going to be a really good way for you to learn exactly what the tool does um, and what you can create with it. Are you going to mirror that chamfer? Uh, so this is just a uh, kind of like an all-in-one, like we want to use all the tools we've learned so far. Uh, your existing, uh, the, the rectangle you made at the beginning, right, should be divided down the middle. Actually, I'll move it back to show you. Here we go. Uh, you can see it's divided down the middle by an axis. Uh, you'll actually use that axis and the plane that comes out of the screen. Right, so if you can imagine that axis coming out of the screen and into the screen, you'll use that plane for the mirror. Uh, so in this case, it's the XY plane, but really it depends on what 
uh, starting fundamental plane you chose uh, and really just mirror that uh, the chamfer and the fillet to create uh, this rounded effect on both ends for your V-belt. So does anyone have any questions about that so far? I know I, know I kind of raced through it. Uh, I don't really expect you to follow along like as I go through it, but I'm just trying to like touch on all the points uh, and kind of get it in your head. So if you have any questions now, we can answer them. So if there's no questions so far, go ahead and continue on to the second half of the CAD guide. Uh, here we'll be making a RoboCup part. Uh, so the last part we made was kind of like general purpose. Uh, I know I've seen them in BattleBots at least. Uh, this is a specific part for RoboCup, though. This is going to be all about symmetry. Um, you do not want to be making each of those cutouts one by one, whether it's one by one in a sketch or one by one in a feature. You really don't want to be doing that. Work smarter, not harder. Um, so you'll see just a brief overview. I'm using holes, radial symmetry, uh, and really just focusing on like making clean and dynamic CAD. Um, brief touch on metric and imperial. Um, I know personally, I have a lot of our tools and kind of want to say all of them. Most of them are imperial, so we'll be dealing with inches and whatnot. Um, sometimes you don't have that choice when you're ordering parts, um, but it's useful to know that you can set a parts setting just default as whether it's imperial or metric. Um, what degree of um, like wh whether it's millimeter or meter. Uh, and those you can see up in the tools document setting um, option. So first we'll make a, a basic circle and extrude that outwards to create this disk. Uh, you can see that we've specified 8.5 millimeters in that extrusion. Um, you could actually say 8.5 inches in that as well. Um, and it will override whatever the part default is, um, which is really useful if you're reading off a sheet, but you want um, metric or whatever conversion you want. But yeah, we'll make this disk. Uh, we're going to make a hole. Um, so actually, given those dimensions, 0 0.625, that's going to be the diameter for a hole. Um, I don't believe these are screw holes, and so we're not going to deal with any of that. It's just going to be a simple hole. And the depth is five millimeters. This is the this is the center cutout. Um, so this is going to be a pretty wide hole that goes all not all the way through, but most of the way through. Now making another hole, we're going to use that project geometry tool we talked about earlier. Uh, so projecting, starting a sketch on the flat end of that part, you can project the existing diet, like the existing circle for that hole into your new sketch. So you don't have to recreate that. You can see now that that green outline is the cutout or the hole we made in the last step. We're going to sketch a real simple hole or a real simple circle, um, throwing that in the center and then using an offset uh, a circle offset will actually define the new circle as just being a certain distance from the old one. Uh, very useful if the inner circle might change depending on design constraints, so you don't have to update the second circle later on. And we use the, the concentric constraint just to tell the software that Hey, these are supposed to be concentric circles. Pretty self-explanatory for that one. Finishing this hole out, we're just going to punch all the way through the part. Um, I believe in this one, we do use an extrusion, um, but really you, you can see how you can use uh, two different tools to get the same effect. Now we're going to get those slots we saw earlier. Um, so creating a new sketch on the back of this part, just go ahead and draft out two rectangles. You can use whatever rectangle tool you're familiar with. Um, 
but with the given dimensions. And as you can see, doing this sketch some 20 times around the circle is going to take you forever, and you're probably going to hate yourself by the end of it. So we're going to try, and after extruding that cut, and extruding again for that second profile. In fact, you probably could have done that. Now that that's, that's two steps because the second extrusion you can see in the picture is actually not all the way through the part. It's just 0.13 inches. Uh, so make sure to watch out for that. You're going to fill it that back in to create the, the curve at, at the end of the cutout. Fill it those inner curves. Um, basically, these, these are partly design choices, but also partly because uh, you can see that inner rectangle that we cut out. If we left it as hard, hard uh, sharp edges or sharp corners, uh, there's no way we could feasibly machine that uh, without. Um, yeah, maybe just it, there's like there's no way we could machine that. You're going to end up with some rounded corner based on the fact that the end mill is rounded. Uh, and this is all assuming that you make this with an end mill. Um, but yeah, we fill it those. Um, that cutout. That'll be one thirty second radius. And so really, if you're thinking about machinability, you're going to have a some radius mill or end mill, um, probably one thirty second end mill. And uh, you can just ride those up towards the corner and back it off at a sharp angle and it'll give you that fillet naturally. A slide for uh, basically what I just said there. Um, you can't really machine the sharp corners. Um, you can maybe do it with a CNC mill, or mm, no, not really with a CNC mill. You need something really complicated. Um, and yeah, yeah, so the, the fillet just makes it machinable. Now we're gonna get to radial symmetry. So you have that really complicated set of extrusions you did don't want to do it manually again because, oh God, why would you want to do that? So you select those two extrusions as your features, and then you select your center axis as your rotation axis, and then you can give it however many copies you want of it. In fact, you can see in the, the picture for the wizard, I believe it says num rollers. So it's actually parameterized how many um, cutouts they have around the circle. So it's very easy changing the parameters. Oh, I want only four cutouts now. Um, you just change those parameters in a spreadsheet and the part will dynamically update to only have four of those cutouts. Super powerful to just change one thing and change it the whole part. And here's some more broad examples for the, the circular pattern. Um, basically, just your features can be anything really. Extrusions, holes, revolves. Uh, if it's a feature, you could probably select it. Rotation axis, same goes there. Uh, it doesn't have to be a fundamental axis. It can be whatever axis you can select. And uh, the degree separation is based on how many you choose. And so there we go. We got all those cutouts in one simple step. Uh, now we're going to do a, a, uh, a reference geometry, so this isn't going to actually become a feature, but it's necessary to create other features. Uh, so we're going to create that work axis off of that center axis, uh, most likely where I think an axle would go. Uh, don't quote me on that in the Urban Cup. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you'll create a work axis, and now that'll project into other sketches and features. We're going to go ahead and uh, select the distance out from the center. Uh, place just a simple point there, making a clearance hole. You've seen this all before. And circular uh, radial symmetry, create three of those. Um, super simple. Now we're going to do another one, except this one is out way further out into the, uh, the outer edge of the part. Um, those, you got to hard code those dimensions in there, um, whether it's from some Dot, like some drawing, like maybe that's what the part should look like or whatever. But once you have that first um, hole down, you can use the radial symmetry tool and get the rest of the four in there. Uh, so you can see a listing of what we used in this 
um, cat god. Uh, and these are rum cup wheels. I mean, there you go. It's, it's easy, easy as that, you know, using all these really powerful tools to create a very complex part um, very easily. Do we have any questions? This one, nope. All right. Um, anything you guys think of right now? I got a hand raise here. Scott, is, uh, is that, you have a question or is that an accident? That was a mistake, my bad. Oh, all good, dude. Sweet. Um, yeah, that's the uh, the guide there. Make sure you guys actually do this, though. Uh, it's really useful to do it yourself because, uh, I mean, you'll make mistakes, but it's learning from those mistakes where you actually remember, like, oh, that's how you do this the right way the next time you got to do it.